Isaiah chapter 3. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 12 this morning. Isaiah chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, and we're going to make a couple of stops over in Romans as well. Isaiah chapter 3, the Bible says, For behold the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water, the mighty man, the man of war, the judge, the prophet, and the prudent, and the ancient, the captain of fifty, and the honorable man, and the counselor, and the cunning artificer, and the eloquent orator. And in the place of those things, and I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. And the people shall be oppressed, every one by another, and every one by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient, and the base against the honorable. When a man shall take hold of his brother or the house of his father, saying, Thou hast clothing, be thou our ruler, and let this ruin be under thy hand. In that day shall he swear, saying, I will not be an healer, for in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler of the people. I'll explain verses 6 and 7 in a little bit. For Jerusalem is ruined, and Judah is fallen, because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of of his glory. The show of their countenance doth witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom, they hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hands shall be given him. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err, and destroy the way of thy paths. When we think of God's divine judgment on a nation or a people, we tend to think about fire and brimstone being rained down upon the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. Or perhaps, when we think of divine judgment, we think of the great global flood of Noah's day where God drowned the whole earth and only eight souls got on board the ark. But God's judgment on a nation does not always have to look like that. In fact, God's judgment can be far more subtle but still achieve its ultimate goal And that is for a people or a nation to repent and get back in right fellowship with Him. Our sermon this morning is entitled, A Nation Under Escalating Judgment. What does that look like? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to gather together in this place and we ask Father, that for the next several moments we might, Lord, concentrate upon your precepts and your principle here in your word. And we ask, Lord, that uh, your son Jesus Christ might be magnified, that the gospel might be proclaimed. And Father, if there be somebody within our midst today that needs to hear the truth and needs to respond to the truth, Father, I pray that today might be that day. And Lord, we pray that as we look through this passage, help us, Father, to see what is clearly here for us today in the 21st century. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we ask it, and all of God's people said. First question I want to answer this morning is, who was Isaiah? Who was Isaiah? Isaiah, of course, is one of the, what we call the major prophets. There are major and minor prophets in the Bible. This doesn't mean that the the minor prophet was less important than the major prophet and that the major prophet was more important than the minor prophet. It just means that the size of their book uh, was all that was being talked about there. So a major prophet usually has more than 12 chapters. In the case of Isaiah, you've got 66 chapters. He's the largest 
of the prophets in terms of the book size. And then, of course, you've got minor prophets where you only have one chapter, frankly. But Isaiah was a prophet that God used both to preach and prophesy against the open rebelliousness of Israel and Judah. Israel at this time was a split kingdom at this time in history, with Judah to the north and Israel to the south. Of the 12 tribes of Israel, two of them were with Judah in the north, while the other 10 were with Israel in the south. Israel was so fractured at this time as a nation that both Judah and Israel each have their own kings with their own civil types of governments. If you will, you could say Isaiah was preaching and prophesying to a nation divided. There really wasn't a distinction between Judah and Israel other than a make-believe line. It was a divided nation. And Isaiah was told to prophesy and to preach to this divided nation. Though both nations were divided, each against each other, they did share a commonality. They rebelled and snubbed their noses at the Lord. And when a nation rebels and does their own thing, God would send a prophet who would preach straightforward, politically incorrect sermons in order to shake them out of their sinful state and back to serving the Lord. Here in Isaiah chapter 3, we read of one such sermon. The judgment of God is going to fall on Judah and Israel, but not in the way judgment had fallen in the past. There would be no fire and no brimstone. There would be no global flood. But there still would be judgment. In chapter 3, there is no fire. In chapter 3, there is no brimstone. And there's nobody here in Isaiah chapter 3 being turned into pillars of salt for looking back. But even though those aspects of God's judgment are not present here in this chapter... The judgments that do follow are no less damning than if it had been fire and brimstone. I want you to notice the application of the text, if you will, the application of the text. Now you say, what do I mean by the application of the text? Well, what I mean by that is when Israel and Judah are the subjects of God's escalating judgment here in Isaiah chapter 3, one cannot help but see an eerie and practical application to what is happening in America today. Now remember, this is what St. Paul said in Romans chapter 15 verse 4, if uh, the the boys want to get this up on on the board. Romans chapter 15 verse 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Boy, as we go back and read that which was written aforetime, hence Isaiah chapter 3, boy, are there some things here that we haven't learned at all. In fact, uh, we're downright in the middle of this chapter, Isaiah chapter 3. We're actually going through much of what this chapter has outlined for us, and we haven't learned a thing. But I want you to see how this 27-year-old sermon, that's an old sermon, folks, directed to Israel and Judah specifically, has direct or at least indirect application to us today in 2023. I want you to notice, first and foremost, a profile of society under judgment. A profile of society under judgment. Look at Isaiah chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And I'm going to slowly and methodically walk us through this chapter. Because sometimes, if you're like me, uh, sometimes you just try to get your Bible reading in so you can say, I got it in. Oh, okay, maybe you're not like that. Maybe you're holier. Maybe you're holier than me, and you just really methodically read through your Bible. Every once in a while, I have got to just slowly read my Bible. The word the Bible uses is meditate. And sometimes I just need to meditate on a passage, break it down, and look at it very carefully. And I see here in Isaiah chapter 3 
Specifically, verses 1 through 7, and of course following, but specifically here in verses 1 through 7, a profile of society under judgment. Notice what it says, For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, does take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff. And then he defines what that means, and I'll get that in just a second. The whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water, comma, The mighty man, the man of war, the judge, the prophet, the prudent, the ancient, the captain of 50, the honorable man, the counselor, the cunning artificer, and the eloquent orator. Now, now why in the world does God say here in verse 1 that he's taking the stay and the staff? Well, the word stay means support, something one relies upon. God using both words here, stay and staff, in this passage, specifically Hebrew terms, suggests that God is going to eliminate both the supply and the support for all of Israel. I'm going to say that again. God is using both words, stay and staff. Look up here. A stay is something that supports, and a staff is something you lean on. It can also be something that leads you. Right? Right? He's going to take away the stay and the staff, suggesting that God is going to eliminate both the supply and the support for all of Israel. This means God is going to take away physical, social, and spiritual things from Israel. All three areas from verse 2 to verse number 4 are all given to you. If you will, the first thing he does is there's going to be a famine of food, or at least food will be awfully hard to get. Notice he says again, For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. Now, you say, well, this doesn't have complete application today uh, because obviously we live in America and we walk into our, depo- into our grocery stores and we naturally want to see full shelves. And when we walk into a store and we don't see full shelves, we think either the rapture has happened, I've been left behind, and there's no toilet paper anymore. Hence 2020. Right? Remember what we did around here at this church? Instead of money, toilet paper was the way, right? Hey, come on, man. Two rolls for a buck. Let's, all right, all right, here we go. Folks, listen, I cannot believe that that was the big deal. I didn't know COVID gave you the runs. But anyway, <laughs> I don't understand it. But that was the big deal, toilet paper. And, that, and then, of course, bottled water. I get it. I know that was important. But guess what? We live in America. We don't expect these things to be gone. But we also need to consider that it's not the San Joaquin Valley that supplies that stuff. Or chilly for the, while we're in the winter months. Because it's summer there. While it's chilly here. <laughs> All right, that's funny. Move on. <laughs> Folks, let me just say something. God is the one who provides what's in that department store. Yeah. It's not the transportation secretary guy. Yeah. It's not who's in charge in the White House. It's who's in heaven. Folks, we're at a time right now where some of us five years ago went to the store and could buy a dozen eggs for a buck ninety-nine. And if we find it for a buck ninety-nine today, we're suspicious of what we're going to get inside the egg. <laughs> I want you to notice what else is going to be stayed here from both Jerusalem and Judah. Not only would food be either there would be either a famine or food would be very hard to get. But I want you to notice that the judgment of God starts at the very top of authority and goes down all the way to the average guy that's on the sidewalk. It starts off with the mighty man, then the man of war, then the judge. You say, what do you got there? You've got the top of the heap, the executive branch. You've got the judicial branch. You got the executive branch. All being talked about here, and the prophet, the church is affected, and the prudent, and the ancient, 
the captain of 50, the honorable man, the counselor, the cunning artificer, and the eloquent orator. Notice that it goes from the top of authority down to the average common guy that's out on the street. In verses 2 through 3, the judgment of God is far worse than merely taking away food and water or making it that much harder to get. God will also deprive Israel of godly and competent leadership on every level. In, in verse number 2, he starts off with the mighty man, which suggests to me that would be the king or the prince or the president. The mighty man. Kings will be compromised and conniving. And then notice he says, secondly, the man of war. Armed forces will be feminized and compromised. And then notice again, the judge. The ju judicial system will be unfair. Notice the prophet. Preachers will be gutless and speaking lies. Notice the next one, the prudent. The prudent means to show no care for the thought of the future. Spend, 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 spend. In other words, the prudent person is not prudent anymore. Let's just keep spending, spending, spending. The ancient, the senior, will offer no words of wisdom. Who do we go to in Israel's day and even today? If we want words of wisdom, we talk to folks that are older than us because they've lived life. Notice here he says that the ancient will offer no words of wisdom. The captain of 50, that means somebody that has authority over people. We can't even find someone that would have authority over just 50 people. Notice the honorable man. The respected within society will not be respected anymore. How about the counselor? One who deliberates or resolves issues. We won't even be able to find someone who can deliberate properly or resolve issues because, well... We don't think there are any issues, and everyone should just agree to disagree. What about the cunning artificer? This is a word that we don't use today, obviously. It's one of those words that everyone's so threatened about in the King James Bible. But the cunning artificer, one who exhibits skills or a craft. We can't even find someone today that has basic skills or is, is, is desiring to exhibit a craft because they are, well... They just don't want to work. What about the eloquent orator? One who speaks clearly and authoritatively, much like we had at the beginning of our country over 250, uh, 240 years ago with our founding fathers. All of them, whether you agreed with them or not on every issue, were eloquent. We can't even find in this judgment that God is going to throw out from the top to the bottom. We can't find anybody in the executive branch. We can't find anybody in the executive branch. We can't find anybody in the judicial branch. We can't find anybody in the legislative branch. That's what I meant earlier. As you guys were like, oh, pastor's slowly getting dementia. Anyway, uh, anyway. Hey, listen, you can say what you want. I've got Jesus in my heart. All right, now listen. Now listen. Folks, listen, I'm just telling you, <laughs> I had to make a little levity there because uh, I think we're going to have to vote him out. Deacons get around and we're going to have to vote him out. That's okay. I got a church in Casper that I'll take over. All right, let's move over. Uh, I don't care. The mighty man, the man of war, the judge, the prophet, the prudent. Listen, you're getting to the point today where leadership at the top is few and far between. Leadership in the Congress and in the Senate is few and far between. We've got leadership in the, in the uh, judicial branch that is unfair to its own people. But I'm not just talking about us. I'm talking about what God was doing to them judgmentally. You've got then the prophet. Notice, the president, the man of war, the judge, the prophet. Notice the fourth thing mentioned is the church, the religious community. Look up here. It's getting few and far between to where you can walk into a Bible-believing congregation and hear a sermon that the pastor is unashamed to just preach the Bible. Amen. We're getting to a point there where we're either going to we're either going to preach the Bible or we're going to capitulate to the culture. We're either going to stand up for scriptural revelation or we're going to stand down against the sexual revolution. 
Notice in verse 3, the captain of the 50, the honorable man, the cunning, uh, the, the counselor, the cunning artificer, and the eloquent order. We can't find these guys anymore. And what you have here in this list from verses 2 and 3, what you have here in this list is a complete societal breakdown from the top of the government to the average Joe on the street. No disrespect to the Joes that are present. And there are three of them. No disrespect at all. This is a complete societal breakdown. You can't find someone reliable at the top. You can't find someone reliable in the pulpit. You can't even find someone reliable walking down the street. So the question is, every aspect of society will be bankrupt. Social norms will be uprooted. Nature will be looked at as passé. So the question for us is, with society breaking down at every level, from the executive branch to the uh, judicial branch to the common man on the street, who will, need, who will end up replacing them in leadership under God's escalating judgment? Uh-oh. Verse 4. It doesn't get any better, folks. And I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. Now, let me offer a qualifier. Now, this could mean metaphorically that people with children's mentality and baby impish qualities are in leadership. Or it can literally mean children and babes would be their rulers. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with whatever you take on that. But I'm kind of more, more on the literalist side. So I'm going to kind of look at this as, well, kind of Greta Thunberg-ish. Yeah. How dare you? <laughs> Children and women shall rule and lord over Israel and Judah and replace the mighty man right. and the man of war and the judge and the prophet and the prudent, and the ancient, the captain of 50, the honorable man, the counselor, the cunning artificer, and the eloquent orator, all replaced by a bunch of impish leadership. When God is judging a nation, children and women will have the authority, while maleness and masculinity will be toxic and must be brought under the subjection of children and women. Children will speak in seats of authority, and women will be men's oppressors. All of this judgment came upon Israel without even one lightning bolt from God or one brimstone from the heavens. What you have here is a complete societal breakdown where everything has been upended. All the norms of society that have been in place since in the beginning God have been uprooted. The natural order has been upended. Society as they knew it was upside down. The final profile of a society under God's escalating judgment is seen in verses 8 through 9. It says, for Jerusalem is ruined, Judah is fallen. Look up here. Not a brimstone fell from heaven. No fire, no flood. And now Jerusalem is ruined and Judah is fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of His glory. Notice it says the tongue and their doings. Not only their talk, but what they're actually doing with that talk. Look up here. Do you know that our society is where it is because it began with the tongue 50 years ago? Yes. 60 years ago. It began with the talk, the conversation. And now here we are 60 years later reaping from the tongue by the doings. They're against the Lord. And notice what it says in verse 8. In order to provoke the eyes of His glory. Now why doesn't it say to provoke the God of glory? Why does it say to provoke the eyes? Isn't that interesting? It's almost like they know that they are upending norms. It's almost like they know that they're uprooting nature. 
They know that there's a God in heaven, not Buddha, not Allah, not any other. They know it's the God of the Old and New Testament. Amen. And they are stubbing their noses at him because so, they know that he sees. Amen. Yep. Verse 9. The show of their countenance, that means their outward appearance, does witness against them. Look up here. I heard someone say this to me the other day. Boy, they look so different. The show of their countenance witnesses against them. Don't you walk out of here and say, well, pastor thinks you can judge a book by its cover. Yes, you can, you dingbat. If you can't judge a book by its cover, then do not buy books. <laughs> If it says to kill a mockingbird, it means that's probably what's in that book. If it says, you know, the ventures of Huckleberry Finn, that's probably what's in that book. You say, what are you doing? I'm judging the contents by the title. I can judge what's inside the book by what's outside the book. Notice again. They show of their countenance, doth witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Just as the Sodom, now listen to me. Just as the Sodomites in Genesis 19 surrounded the house of Lot in broad daylight in order to gang rape the two men that Lot had housed, so too was the sin of Israel here in Isaiah chapter 3. There was no shame. There was no standard. There was no concern. It's all out in the open. Why not? No one's going to stop me because everyone from the top all the way through the middle down to the bottom is on my side anyway. In order to highlight this sin of Sodom, I, I, I do find it interesting that right here in the middle of verse 9, we've got this sin of Sodom mentioned. And he compares it. He says, they declare their sin as Sodom, they hide it not. There's no shame, there's no, there's no uh, embarrassment. Uh, it, it's, it used to be, if you will, in the closet. But now they're trying to march with the Macy's Thanksgiving parade. And they're in our parade, and they're all over the place, and they're, in your, they're gay and they're in your face. Now, I'm going to say something to you. Are you catching this on the recording? All right. I've got no problem with a sodomite coming into this service and hearing the sermon. I want everyone to know that anybody, regardless of state, sexual status, religious background, monetary background, now if you're rich, you're even more welcome. But the fact is, I don't care who you are. You're welcome to sit in this service and hear the word of God. You're welcome. Any one of you. Now, if God is dealing with you, God will bring up the sin that you're in. And it doesn't always have to be homosexuality. It could be a heterosexual sin. It could, I don't care what it is. God's going God's to put his finger on that particular sin, and he is going to cause your hands to sweat in the middle of a sermon, and he's going to cause your heart to rush, thinking it's going to beat out of your chest until you get it right with him. Now, we're going to have to deviate ever so slightly from Isaiah chapter 3 because I want to talk a little bit about this sin of Sodom, that they're hiding it not. And I want you to notice how this aspect of judgment is part of the escalating judgment of God. Go to Romans 1. Keep your finger in Isaiah chapter 3. We're coming right back there, but just go to Romans chapter 1. And I just want you to notice something here. This, you say, Pastor, you always end up here. Yeah, because we're here. That's right. Like we're like here now. Yes. Like Romans 1 was a novelty in 20, 2002 when I started Freedom's Way Baptist Church. was a bit of a novelty to read this. You know how I used to say Romans chapter 1 applied? Well, this is kind of how they were before the flood, which has application to that, which has application. Because obviously, whatever debauchery men and women were doing before the flood got God's attention to the point where he destroyed them. But, but, but what, here's, what, what I find funny is, 
it, it doesn't have just application to before the flood. It has application to right now or, frankly, every generation. And I want you to notice something about Romans chapter 1 here. And this is why most people have a real big problem with everything outside of the Gospels. I had a gentleman on my uh, program uh, a few weeks ago uh, who wears a backwards collar. And uh, he had a problem with the writings of Paul. Now, he didn't say this on the radio, but, but I was talking to him afterwards. And I was mentioning some things about the book of Romans. And he said, listen. Um, we don't know exactly what Paul said, and we don't exactly know what was inspired and what is inspired. I says, whoa. So now, some of you have to go back a few years to this. How many of you remember a thing called the Jesus Seminar? Okay, you guys got to get yourself attuned to what is going on here. Because 30 years ago, there was this seminar of a bunch of esteemed, very leftist Bible scholars who would look at a Bible verse, and they would use three different marbles. Red meant this was genuinely biblical. Gray meant we're not sure. And black meant it's not the Bible. When, when they, now, let me translate that. Red meant they agreed with it. Gray was, oh, this, one's, this verse doesn't feel very comfortable. And black meant this is specifically speaking out against our sin, so it's not the Bible. So that's what that meant. That's what those color patterns meant. So let me just tell you that what we're reading in Romans is God's inspired, inerrant word for every generation of people. Notice Romans chapter 1, and I want you to look at verse number 26. Uh, actually, nope, up, up, go to verse number 18. I'm not going to read all of it. I just want you to notice verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. All right, notice that wrath is mentioned. Wrath is judgment. All right? How do you know that? You ever had a dad? All right. Sometimes he would show his wrath, right? Or when, when he was at work, there was a day when mom was at home and dad was at work, and mom would say, you wait till dad gets home because he's going to show you his wrath. That's right. But anyway, notice this says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. This goes back to Isaiah 3. They know that God's looking. They know this is why they're snubbing their nose at him so that his eyes would behold it. Look up here. So the wrath of God's revealed. Now, what, what is the wrath of God? What does the wrath of God look like? Look at verse number 26. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burn in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their heir which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Amen. Folks, I just want you to know that all of that judgment, all of that wrath there in Romans 1 came without one raindrop, right. came without one fire or one piece of brimstone falling from the heavens. Right. Part of the wrath of God is giving a society over to what they want to do. Yes. Which then leads me to my final point, which... Please do not be deceived. That doesn't mean the conclusion of the sermon. But it does mean we are rounding third. The pattern, and because I know nothing about baseball, this means nothing to you either. All right. The pattern of society under judgment. Quickly. The pattern of society under judgment. Notice Isaiah chapter 3, verse number 10. Isaiah chapter 3. Verse number 10. Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they, not the righteous, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Now in the middle of this, God is offering a little reprieve to some people who are walking with him. Yes. Look up here. This dovetails a little bit with our sermon from last Sunday, where, which we obviously don't want to get into now because I might make another YouTube clip. But, uh, <laughs> but 
what this is talking about here, remember last Sunday we were talking about how uh, the psalmist was offering an imprecatory psalm saying, God, when are you not, when are you going to deal with these evil people? The psalmist is getting impatient saying, God, I'm seeing them run over you. I'm seeing them roughshod over your word. I'm seeing them just living riotously and there seems to be no restraint <coughs> to their behavior. And so therefore, listen to me closely. What we get here in the middle of this is this. Verse 10. God says to Isaiah, say this to the righteous. Look up here. Say this to the people who are living amongst these people. Are we, are we there? Say this to them, that it'll be well with you. Amen. Now look up here. This doesn't mean that you won't get caught up. This doesn't mean you won't get name called. This doesn't mean you won't get an Instagram post about you. This doesn't mean anything like that. It doesn't even mean that you might not even be spit on. Or have something thrown at you. It's all verbal now. But it's getting there. He says, say to the righteous, it'll be well with him. For they, what he just got done talking about, shall eat the fruit of their doing. Wait a minute, what do you mean by that? Look at verse 11. Woe unto the wicked. It shall be ill with him. For the reward of his hand shall be given him. And then in Romans 128, you don't need to turn there, look, it up, look up on the screen. Romans 128, because you're going to stay in Isaiah. Romans 128, look what it says. Jerry's there right now, because he's got the Bible on his fingertips. Romans 128. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over. What does that mean? There's nothing scarier than when God just lets go of the reins and says, if you don't want the restraints of my counsel, then have at it and be eaten alive of your own sin. That's scary. When God says, you don't want me? Good. I'm going to step back. And I'm going to let you guys eat each other alive. And then when the righteous get right again and call on me, and you guys get right, I'm going to step back in. And I'm going to give you time to repent. The greatest form of God's judgment on any nation is when God just simply lets go of the reins and ceases to step on the brakes and just allow society to do what society wants to do until it is no longer a recognizable society. See, all God did here in Isaiah 3, and essentially, if we want to take Romans 1, all He did in Romans 1 was to just let the sinner be the sinner yes. without any repercussion. That's right. Look up here. He didn't get any pushback from the top That's right. because the, the top was compromised. He didn't get any pushback from the judges. They were on their side. That's right. They didn't get any pushback from the pulpit because the preachers were all compromised messes too. And they weren't going to get any pushback from the common guy walking on the sidewalk because they were scared to death to compromise and to contradict what was coming from the top. Oh, yeah, man. Oh, yeah, man. We are seeing what happened in Isaiah happening in America. And if you don't see the parallels, I will use King James English. Thou art stupid. <laughs> We, we, we are seeing that in all level of society, from the very top of leadership to the parents in a school board meeting, 
are compromised or are at least trying to push back, and when they do, they are ridiculed for doing what was normal like five minutes ago. I find it odd that that is where we are, and I find it to be part of God's judgment on a nation. One last thing. Go back to Isaiah chapter 3. I wanted to comment on two verses. Verse 6 and 7, which you might look at that and say, what does that mean? Right, Cindy? Look at verses 6 and 7. In the middle of these things of children and women being the oppressors, the Bible says, when a man shall take hold of his brother, of the, uh, when a man shall take hold of his brother of the house of his father, <laughs> saying, thou hast clothing, be thou our ruler, and let this ruin be under thy hand. In that day shall he swear, saying, I will not be an healer, for in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler over the people. Let me illustrate what I mean by that. What these verses are saying is that someone who at least has, at least perceptually, some success, some mediocre accomplishment that in any other God-blessed society would be looked at as just nominal, that now is seen as really good. And therefore, we want you to be the ruler over us because, hey, you've got clothes at your house. We don't even have them at ours. You've got clothes. Please be a ruler. Look up here. And let this ruin be under your hand. You know what's funny? They recognize that what society they've been given is ruined. They recognize it. Verse number seven. Then that guy that they're trying to make a ruler says, In that day shall he swear, saying, I will not be a healer. You say, what do you mean? I can't be the guy that cleans this up. For in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler of the people. In other words, what you perceive about me isn't true. That's just what you perceive about me, even though it's very nominal. Look up here. Everybody, everybody in a society should be able to have clothing and some food. That's generally speaking. I understand there's places in the world where that's not the case. But generally speaking, where a society is following after the Lord, those are two basic things you've got. I'm assuming every one of you probably has it. This is going to be looked at in a society like this as a major achievement. That guy has got clothes in his closet. Let's make him our ruler and maybe he'll clean up this mess. Folks, one last look at verse 12. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err. Now, let me offer a qualifier. When it says women shall rule over them, this doesn't mean women generally, but a specific kind. Because obviously, if you read your Bible, there are two books in your Bible, only two out of 66, but there are two that are named after a woman, yes. Ruth and Esther. And both of them are highly favored. Yes. If you read the book of Judges, God sometimes raised up a woman as a judge in order to aid Israel. So this is not God slighting women. What this is, is a type of woman that's ruling in a society where God's hand has been taken away. And what I find, and this is just my plain redneck backwoods op observation, which means it's probably spot on. 
I am noticing, and I have noticed, young people that are not of voting age, that cannot legally drink, shouting and saying things concerning adults and saying that adults don't have the right to do A, B, and C for me who can't even drink legally. And I am seeing more women in places of leadership in the bad way. And I'm seeing a retreat of men saying, I'm not starting a a Dads for Liberty. Why not? We've already got Moms for Liberty. Why are Dads for Liberty? Moms for Liberty is good. That covers it. When you go back to our, our nation, when you go back to the Bible, this again is not a slide on women. Don't even start there. If you think that is the case, I'm going to go back to my King James words, thou art dumb. That's not what this is about. I've already qualified this. This is a certain type of a kid. How dare you? And this is a certain type of a woman who does this when elections don't go their way. Ah! They're on YouTube. Find them. If you want to be happy, just go on YouTube and find them. Now, folks, now, folks, If you don't see parallels there, then I don't know what to say. But the scariest part of it is when God says, I'm not even checking the brakes anymore. I'm going to let you eat the fruit of your own doings. Do you know that there's a whole generation today, let me close with this, a whole generation that is so all in to this sinful sexual agenda that they're not even thinking about the fact that they won't even have grandchildren. Yes, folks. They're not even thinking about it because they're so all in on the optics of being the now. And one day they're going to get old and they're going to be in a bed dying. And there'll be no young kids or no grandkids coming up and saying, hey, Grandma, we're going to miss you when you go to heaven. But we're gonna, we'll make it there too. Yeah. Hey, Grandpa, we're going to miss you when you go to heaven. Hey, but guess what? We're going to come too. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Right. Some of you in here are blessed with kids. Some of you are even more blessed with grandkids. You say, why more blessed? Because you get to spoil them and take them back with your kids, right? <laughs> get them out of here. Right? <laughs> Right? You can do whatever you want with them. But they don't have to stay with you perpetually. They've got to stay with your kids. <laughs> Folks, there's a whole generation out there that's not even thinking about that. And there's a whole generation of kids, for the sake of optics, listen closely, that, realize, that don't even realize they can't even have children. Yeah. Let me get a little more personal. Won't even be able to understand what an orgasm is which is something God gave. Amen. Amen. Don't get weird on me. Don't get weird on me. God did that. God's not a prude. They won't even understand what that is. You say, why? Because we're all in for the optics. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to look to your word, Father, to look at Isaiah chapter 3 and just, Father, look at the parallels that are so eerie between Israel and Judah and how, Lord, you just simply let them do what they wanted to do. And, Father, I see a little of that, if not a lot of that, happening in our nation today. And, Father, this wasn't happening globally here. This was just you dialing in on Israel and Judah. 
I'm sure there were all kinds of other sins happening in other nations at the same time that you, Isaiah the prophet was preaching this sermon. Father, you were wanting us to be dialed in and magnified on this particular sermon. And Father, again, the only hope for this nation, the only hope is for people to return to the God of the Bible. Not a superficial repentance, but a genuine repentance. And if that doesn't happen, then I'm glad God also has a secondary plan. We call it even so, come Lord Jesus. And again, I pray that we might be able to be like you centered out the righteous there in Isaiah chapter 3 and said to them, but to the righteous, it'll be well with you. Man, let's just hold out and do our best in, our, in this society that we're in today to just hold the rope for righteousness, to hold the rope for truth, to hold the rope of godliness and holiness. Allow us to be a contrast Never allow us to camouflage in. Help us to stick out like the sore, thrum, sore thumbs we are supposed to be. And Lord, they'll call us out when we do. Because we are not, this church is not, this preacher is not going to bend to the culture. We are going to stand for righteousness and stand for Christ come hell or high water. And Father, I pray you would give these people that have chosen to worship in this church during this time or to borrow a phrase from Esther for such a time as this, that this is where they've chosen to place their roots in the midst of a society that is literally breaking down from the top to the bottom. And Father, we ask today you might give us the spiritual fortitude to stand. Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed and our eyes closed this morning as Brother Sherlock plays. If God's touched your heart today and you want to pray about something, the altar is open to you this morning. Don't be ashamed. If God's touched your heart today, you take a moment as Brother Sherlock plays.